This is part two of an instructional video on performing an auxiliary brachial plexus block that covers some further tips and tricks to advance your practice. Let's start with tips on how to confidently identify the main terminal nerves. As discussed in the first video, the key landmarks are the auxiliary artery and chondrine tendon. The radial, median and ulnar nerve are clustered around the artery at this level in characteristic locations. The radial nerve is always lying on the chondrine tendon in the 3 to 7 o'clock position. The median nerve is usually in the 10 to 12 o'clock position adjacent to the coracobrachialis muscle. And the ulnar nerve is next to the median nerve in the 3 to 12 o'clock position. The musculocutaneous nerve is in the 7 to 9 o'clock position, usually within the coracobrachialis muscle. The process of pattern recognition becomes easier the more examples you see. Here are a few to get you started. See if you can identify the radial nerve, median nerve, and ulnar nerve in this image. As always, start with the chondrine tendon, investing fascia, and border of coracobrachialis to define the outer boundaries of the neurovascular bundle. The radial nerve is almost the same size as the artery, often, if not always, hyperechoic and lying on the chondrine tendon. The median nerve is adjacent to the coracobrachialis, and in this case, at 10 o'clock to the artery. The ulnar nerve is at 2 o'clock. Note that both these nerves are always smaller than the radial. There is yet a smaller nerve medial to the ulnar nerve, and this, if seen, is the medial brachial cutaneous nerve. It is often, but not always, seen. The muscular cutaneous nerve in this still image is not apparent, but can be expected to lie somewhere along the fascial plane that divides coracobrachialis. This next one is a more difficult image to interpret. The chondrine tendon is not very clear, but this is because of anisotropy. The probe has not been tilted to the correct angle. However, its position is still obvious from the dark underlying muscle. The artery and veins are visible. The radial nerve is not very clear, but as always, we know that it has to be the vague hyperechoic structure lying on the chondrine tendon. It will become more visible once local anesthetic is injected in this compartment. The median nerve is adjacent to coracobrachialis and the ulnar nerve next to it. The musculocutaneous nerve is in the fascial plane in the coracobrachialis muscle. Dynamic scanning is also important for image interpretation as the nerves do not always stay in one position. In this image, we see the chondrine tendon the radial nerve medial to the artery on the chondrine tendon, the ulnar nerve above the radial nerve, and a medial nerve that is draped over the lateral side of the artery. The musculocutaneous nerve is visible just next to the median nerve in the muscle. As we scan more proximally, the median nerve slides up into a more conventional position anterior to the artery. The following video illustrates this in real time. Distal to the chondrine tendon, the median nerve is at the 5 o'clock position to the artery. As the probe is slid more proximally, the median nerve slides up the artery into a more normal position. In the final frame of the video, the median nerve, ulnar nerve, and radial nerve can all be seen neatly stacked on top of each other. The identity and location of each nerve can also be confirmed by scanning proximally and distally. Each nerve will follow a characteristic course further down the arm. As the probe is slid distally to the mid-humeral area, the median nerve stays adjacent to the axillary artery, but the ulnar nerve pulls away to lie more medially and in a superficial location under the investing fascia. The radial nerve, as we have said multiple times, is always the hyperechoic, somewhat vague shape lying on top of the chondrine tendon. 
If confirmation is needed, however, sliding the probe distally to the mid-humeral area will show the radial nerve dropping posteriorly in a fascial plane between heads of the triceps towards the spiral groove on the posterior surface of the humerus. The radial nerve exhibits a characteristic rising and sinking motion as the probe is slid back and forth. This is a video of an unusual axillary brachial plexus. Unusual features include the large and dark hypoechoic appearance of the nerves. These are not veins or accessory arteries as they are neither compressible or pulsatile. The position of the nerve elements is also atypical, making identification from pattern recognition alone tricky. This is where a traceback scanning approach is useful. As we slide the probes distally, the musculocutaneous nerve is clearly evident. The median nerve is highly unusual in this patient. It is very hypoechoic and very mobile, taking up different positions around the artery depending on level, as you will see. As we scan more distally, the median nerve slides around the artery onto its medial side, but always stays adjacent to the artery. The ulnar nerve lies more medial and separate from the artery under the investing fascia. The radial nerve is also visible here, sliding towards the posterior humerus between the heads of triceps. The radial nerve can be followed proximally to confirm its location on the conjoined tendon. Now, the identity and location of all the four main nerves can be confirmed. Let's now look at some alternative ways to approach the plexus with the block needle. As described in my first auxiliary block video, a common way to block the radial nerve is to target the junction between the conjoined tendon and the artery and to fill the radial nerve compartment from below. However, the compartment may also be entered from above by piercing the dividing fascia that separates the ulnar nerve and radial nerve compartments. This video illustrates the single pass approach to the axillary block. The needle is advanced at a 30 to 45 degree angle between artery and median nerve to enter the neurovascular sheath. Local anesthetic injection pushes the median and ulnar nerves aside. The needle is then advanced over the radial nerve to enter the medial corner of the posterior compartment. This will be signaled by a visual and tactile pop. Injection here is clearly in a separate compartment from that of the median and ulnar nerves and can be seen to spread around the radial nerve. The needle is then withdrawn and further local deposited around the median and ulnar nerve as necessary. As usual, the musculocutaneous nerve must be injected separately. Another approach that can be used is the out-of-plane approach. The main advantages are that it can always be achieved with a single skin puncture site, and that regardless of which side you are blocking, you can always use the same hand for needling or probe handling. It also does not involve passing through the coracobrachialis, shortening the needle path and reducing procedural pain. The main limitations are that the out-of-plane approach is less familiar to most people, and unlike the in-plane approach, it is not generally possible if the shoulder cannot be abducted to 90 degrees and externally rotated. It is, however, a simple block as it basically involves injection into distinct fascial compartments around the axillary artery. These compartments have been discussed in my first video on the basic axillary block, but to recap, the neurovascular bundle is encapsulated by the investing fascia, the conjoined tendon, and the medial border of coracobrachialis. This neurovascular sheath is divided into an anterior and posterior compartment. The needle can be inserted 
along the medial aspect of the artery to pop through the investing fascia into the anterior compartment. And a small amount of local anesthetic can be injected to push structures aside. The needle is then advanced further to pop into the posterior compartment. 10 to 15 mils can be injected here and the needle then withdrawn back into the anterior compartment to finish off the volume of injection to a total of 10 to 20 mils. This is very similar in concept to the old trans-arterial auxiliary block. The needle is then withdrawn to the skin and advanced laterally to pierce the fascial plane in coracobrachialis that envelops the musculocutaneous nerve. 5 mils is injected here. It is, however, a simple matter with a little practice to locate the nerves, as I have already shown, and this is always recommended to minimize the risk of needle nerve trauma. The musculocutaneous nerve is usually obvious. The radial nerve is in the posterior compartment of the conjoint tendon. The median nerve is adjacent to coracobrachialis, and the ulnar nerve is next to the median nerve, both in the anterior compartment. Hydrolocation following the tactile pop into each compartment will push the nerves aside and outline them, making identification easier. The following video will illustrate this process. The probe is applied with relatively light pressure, allowing identification of the axillary veins, which should also be avoided where possible. It is essential in the out-of-plane approach to advance fascial layer by fascial layer as signaled by tactile pops and confirmed by hydrolocation. The needle is advanced through the skin to start and then through the superficial investing fascia, aiming to pass medial to the median nerve. Note the median nerve rolling aside as the needle is advanced. A tactile and visual pop indicates that investing fascia has been pierced and hydrolocation will confirm this. The needle is advanced deeper to pierce the roof of the radial compartment, again signaled by a pop and confirmed by hydrolocation. Injection of 6 to 8 milliliters here is sufficient to cover the radial nerve. The needle is then withdrawn back into the anterior compartment. Further local anesthetic is injected here while the spread around the median and ulnar nerves is assessed. Not much needle repositioning is needed as the local anesthetic in this case spreads throughout the anterior compartment. The needle is then withdrawn to the skin and advanced laterally through coracobrachialis to the musculocutaneous nerve. The needle tip is evident by its motion. Tenting of the fascia and the pop through is also obvious. Local anesthetic surrounds and pushes the nerve aside. A post injection scan confirms adequate spread around all nerves. Here is another example to reinforce the concept. A pre-scan shows the locations of the terminal nerves, including the musculocutaneous nerve, which is out laterally in the coracobrachialis. The axillary veins are located by releasing probe pressure. The needle is inserted at a steep angle to keep the tip as close to the ultrasound beam as much as possible. The needle in this case is directed medial to the ulnar nerve to pop through the investing fascia. Local anesthetic is injected. The needle is then carefully advanced past the ulnar nerve with hydrodissection until it pierces through the roof of the posterior compartment. Entry is confirmed by a pop 
and local anesthetic that spreads posterior to the artery and around the radial nerve. This is seen here. Once injection in the radial nerve is completed, the needle is then withdrawn into the anterior compartment. Further injection is performed. Note that there is little apparent spread to the median nerve. So the needle is withdrawn to the skin and directed laterally to inject around the median nerve. Note that a good view of the needle tip can be obtained with this tangential needle trajectory towards the lateral aspect. The important endpoint is local anesthetic spread in each compartment around the individual nerves. Finally, the musculocutaneous nerve is covered by piercing the sheath, withdrawing slightly as needed, and performing injection that spreads within the fascial envelope around the nerve. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out the first video in this series on the basics of the axillary brachial plexus block, as well as other videos on the infraclavicular brachial plexus block and the superior trunk block.